there's a project that uh, my company is actually working on um, at the moment for a, a new mine on the west coast, um, which is due to connect to the network. Quite a big um, load. Uh, we're talking about probably doubling the almost doubling the west coast's electrical load with this one one Bitcoin mine, which is a pretty big deal um, when you think about it. Um, so, and you know, this is to me is just super exciting because you know I see this massive potential with you know, Bitcoin mining paired with new generation sources, solar, wind, um, that type of thing. And they're just so complimentary. Hello, I am Cody Allingham, and this is the Transformation of Value podcast. In this episode, I talk with Brad Henderson, a power system engineer and head of engineering and design at Electronet, a New Zealand owned consultancy firm. Brad shares some exciting details about a new Bitcoin mining facility that his firm has been involved with on the west coast of New Zealand. We discuss what energy sovereignty might mean for New Zealand, including the importance of electrifying the economy and how Bitcoin mining and solar power may help create energy abundance. If you would like to support the show and my work, please consider leaving a review on your favorite podcasting app or tipping some Bitcoin to the show's wallet. Otherwise, pass this episode on to a friend who you think may enjoy it. If you have any questions or feedback, please reach out. My emails are always open. Hello at the transformation of value.com. Otherwise, on to the show. Brad, how have you been? Uh, pretty well, actually. I've just had one of those uh, crazy days. I'm actually in Auckland um, at our Auckland office. I've came up on the 545 and uh, interviews and meetings all day and just got back from another uh, coffee date with a potential uh, new colleague and yeah it's been a bit of a hectic and I'm just uh, running on coffee. <laughs> yeah well no worries well hopefully we'll make this into a relaxing and enjoyable conversation um, in fact you sent through some um, things to discuss a couple of notes so you actually did my job for me as well which is kind of uh, kind of awesome but it sounds like there's been some uh, some awesome developments uh, since we, we last caught up on the show last year um, around what uh, the work you're doing uh, with renewable uh, energy in New Zealand um, and maybe some of the broader uh, things that you're seeing around Bitcoin mining and the opportunities for that uh, in New Zealand. So I guess, where do you, where do you want to start, man? Oh, good, good question. Um, I think, you know, we, let's start with the, um, the Bitcoin mining piece because I think that's something that I'm um, pretty passionate about and um, sort of it segues into that uh, energy sovereignty piece, I think, quite nicely. So, um, yeah, I, I mentioned to you that there's a there's a project that I actually still can't talk about it because it's still confidential. But there's a project that uh, my company is actually working on um, in the moment for a, a new mine on the west coast, um, which is due to connect to the network. Quite a big um, load. Uh, we're talking about probably doubling the almost doubling the west coast's electrical load with this one one Bitcoin mine, which is a pretty big deal um, when you think about it. Um, so, and you know, this is to me is just super exciting because you know I see this massive potential with you know, Bitcoin mining paired with new generation sources, solar, wind, um, that type of thing, and it, they're just so complementary. And I think we're just we're just early days getting into exploring the, this potential. Yeah, well, I mean, I've since we last spoke as well, I've continued to grow my interest in mining. I think um, there's, you know, being outside of New Zealand, looking back in, I think there's some real challenges that the country is going through at the moment. And I think a lot of them can come back to two things, really, or maybe one thing, but certainly the money. Uh, and then secondly, the infrastructure. You know, it's this kind of long island, this this mountainous, you know, geoactive um uh, island of uh, of New Zealand and within that though there is a lot of opportunities um, and so I'm, I'm kind of hopeful for the future at how Bitcoin mining can play a role in this kind of new New Zealand which I, I think we will begin to I, I think oh, I'm hoping it, it begins to emerge in, 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 the, in the coming years because things aren't really looking that good at the moment man to be honest like uh, You've got issues with um, roads, you've got issues with power, you've got issues with, you know, cost of living. And I don't want to see New Zealand go backwards, you know. And so that's where I 100%. sort of bringing the we back into it. You know, I think a, a national conversation around what we want to do there and, and then people sort of stepping up and doing it, which sounds like you're, you're involved with some of that work. And I mean, we do know that already there is some Bitcoin mining taking place in New Zealand. Um, and it's uh, renewable, sustainable. Um, it's an export industry, right? 
Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I just love this concept of um, thinking about, you know, buying your sats and, and getting them in. It's come from, you know, a local, I know, I know Bitcoin's the whole concept of it is a global interconnected thing, but it's still very nice to have that that local connection to thinking about where your sats might have come from, you know, and if, if New Zealand can get to a place where we're mining more than there's demand for um, sats internally, I mean, that would be, that would be awesome. Um, I think we've, I think we're nowhere near there yet, right? Well, I, th I think there's a couple of pieces here. So one, um, you'd be familiar with um, how payouts work and the current mining pool structure. And I think we're seeing some challenges and some disruptions to mining pools, which are arguably the most centralized part of Bitcoin at the moment. Um, however, there's a few things that are emerging. Are you familiar with Ocean Pool? I'm not actually, no. No, so, I mean, most people, when they think of Bitcoin mining, um, or, you know, when, when talking to miners that, you know, they're talking about something like Brains, Luxor, one of these sort of major pools that anyone can join. Uh, but the problem is you don't get to choose the block template. You're generally relying on their payout schedules and their honesty to tell you what, you know, what, what is your Bitcoin. Sure. Um, and so there, there is kind of a criticism that maybe you're a, you're a hasher, you're not a miner per se. You're, you're just sort of renting your hash rate. Yeah. Well, something like mine, uh, Ocean Pool, uh, there is this opportunity where it is sort of um, programmatically done. And so, you, you know, there's no way to kind of take uh, transaction fees uh, and, and kind of hide, uh, you know, hide what you're paying out to the to the, um, the individual workers and individual miners. Uh, and also uh, you, how would you say, the, the, the model of payouts, which is around regular payouts, you know, every day, every, every couple of hours or whatever, um, that, that changes, right? When you're on a system like that, it's only whenever your pool gets a block but when it does get a block you you get your honest percentage of that block um, but that kind of framework coupled with lightning payouts I think could really feed into the vision you just described of New Zealanders buying New Zealand uh, mined Bitcoin where you know the the mi small miners people like myself or, or larger operations could sell that Bitcoin uh, locally or in very small amounts even if they need to you know sort of you know, 5,000 Satoshis, even whatever a small amount you want to go for uh, directly into, you know, over lightning. And then that can also get brought, you know, locally through uh, something like Lightning Pay, which is a startup that's actually come out in New Zealand recently doing lightning. I was just listening to your, your podcast, oh, yeah. actually, the latest one that's dropped right this morning, actually, and learning about that, which is yeah. quite, quite cool, isn't it? Yeah. So I'm, um, Brad, I'm very bullish on how lightning and that connection with the mining side means, you know, it's not this kind of long winded process where it's, it can be very much like a daily, a daily sale um, or, or, mm. or hourly or whatever it needs to be straight onto the market and then brought straight from the market with very low fees, especially as we, you know, if we see high transaction fees potentially, but anyway, that's just sort of a segue on sort of what I'm saying. Yeah. 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 Cool. No, it's, um, and, and I, I'm getting uh, sidetracked a little bit, but I'm interested in how do you, how do you sort of see the, um, the landscape at the moment in terms of, uh, you know, the, I guess the, the zeitgeist of, of, of Bitcoin. I mean, you're pretty close to it and, um, of obviously there's a bit of froth around at the moment with, uh, the halving coming up and, and that kind of stuff. And it's the, it's pumped in the markets and all that. And do you, do you think we're getting a bit more cut through with, um, people understanding or people being orange pilled, so to speak, and understanding the real, the depth of Bitcoin rather than just the, oh, here's another asset boom bust thing going on. Yeah. I mean, I, I certainly think the ETFs and number go up have had a huge yep. impact. Um, basically, there's a psychological mechanism where when it suddenly does start mooning, which it has in the last couple of months, um, I mean, we've all been, you know, diamond hands for, for many years now through the bear market. Yep. Uh, however, when the number does actually start go up and it starts getting some mainstream news coverage, um, it is just a psychological switch. And I know a lot of people have told me they've got people starting to come to them now talking about Bitcoin, you know, long lost uh, friends starting to say, hey, you know, that Bitcoin you gave me two years ago, that little, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. that little demo wallet you set up, can, how can I get it? Um, <laughs> at the same time, you got you got people selling as well. You know, they're finally maybe back in the, in the black, mm -hmm. I guess, um, yep. uh, in terms of, uh, you know, their, their fiat value. So I'm, I'm very bullish on the future. Uh, and where we're at, where we're at at the moment, how it affects the mining side, I'm not sure yet. I think we're in a good price position where, even if the halvening happens at this price point, I, I don't think it's going to be like uh, is is not going to be as significant as if we were, you know, back where we were you know, a year ago, or whatever. So, 
I mean, that's the idea behind the halv- halving, right? Is that you should expect the price to the fiat price of Bitcoin to go up, right? Yeah. Um, to to match that reward, so that the the uh, miners are still getting a fair reward for their for their work, right? Yeah, and and look, I mean, yeah. I actually have just been working on an article. Um, I've been having some high level conversations with, you know, just sort of by virtue of doing the podcast, a lot of people reach out to me and and just sort of um, privately having conversations with people about mining and what it means, kind of from a uh, maybe from a, an investment perspective, not that I give invest, investment advice, but you know, sort of like what what do you need to know? What's the the explain like I'm five of Bitcoin mining, and I think people are starting to really look at some of the stuff that's getting stood up in in Texas and other parts of the world. These like actual mm. you know facilities. You know, these aren't just guys in their in their backyard. These are proper you know data centers. Um, and there's I mean, there's an argument to be said that that's an unsustainable business model as well. I think. A lot of people are asking very, you know, very pointy questions about what what it all means. You know, can you have, yep. you know, ten thousand machines in, in one data warehouse? You know, is that a threat actually to the network if it goes offline? If um, it, it gets captured, yep. and a lot of these large miners, you know, they are captured in the sense they've got shareholders, they've got you know, think processes they have to go through, whereas the guy in his backyard is just you know doing what he wants. So it's an ecosystem, I guess, at the end of the day, of different players. Yeah, and I think you'll see, um, you know, like any ecosystem, you see that um, development of all kinds of different people bringing um, mining projects to to bear. Like you, you'll see the mum and pop operation, um, like yourself, basically with a um, S nine in the corner, um, heating up your living room, um, right through to these, you know, giant conglomerates and stuff. And I think that's the beauty of of Bitcoin, right? Is it it gives space for for scalability of, of all sizes. And I, I just love that about it. It's the slow barrier to entry. Yeah. Um, away you go. And it's it all, all it asks of you is you, you do a bit of work, right? Just to, to think about it and understand what it all means. And um, to me, that's the power of it. Yeah. A little, a little bit of proof of work. And um, w- w- one thing that's probably worth mentioning. So um, I, I've had a couple of conversations recently going deeper into the mining story and kind of what it, sure. what it really means. And, Starting to, um, you know, I've, I've uh, invested a little bit more into my into my fleet, I guess you could say, um, and sort of what I'm doing. And one of the things that you mentioned to me was how Bitcoin, it's it's converting energy directly into currency, right? And I'm beginning to wonder what the paradigm shift looks like when you start having energy priced in Bitcoin. Is that something you've thought about at all? Well, uh, yeah, totally, and I think it already is, right? Because I mean, you can. Simplistically, you can look at um, Satoshis and almost do the direct translation from kilowatt hours um, into into Satoshis, right? It's almost, and I think longer term, that's where I see the that how the value of Bitcoin will be measured will be measured in terms of energy. At the moment, people still tag it to fiat, right? But how do you how do you come up with a real world value for for Bitcoin? When there's no fiat around, right? It, say say that it, it is the reserve currency in the world, right? And there's no fiat. How do you value it? Um, I think energy seems to me like the logical way to do it because you can always go, well, I know I know how many kilowatt hours it takes me to heat up my room on a cold winter's night. Um, I know the value of that, um, and you can translate that back. And I think, and there's a lot, you know, everybody uses electricity all the time for everything, um, and yeah. we're only getting more of it. Uh, needing a more and more of it all the time and i just yeah. love that to me that interconnectivity and that exchangeability um almost one-to-one relationship as i see it between energy yeah. and and bitcoin yeah the the, the, the sort of five-dimensional chess that i've been playing I, I did an episode a couple of weeks back um, with a guy brett scott and he I, I had a lot to think about he, he definitely challenged some of my views around money and he gave me some insight and then I've, I, I, I felt I needed to learn more about what he was talking about when it came to credit theories of money. And I've recently mm-hmm. started reading Lynn Olden's Broken Money. Um, are you familiar with that book? I'm not actually, no. no. Um, it's a really good compliment to like the Bitcoin standard um, by Saifedean. Yep. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm working through that. And, um, you know, she does a really good job of basically consolidating ledger theories of money with um, kind of commodity theories of money and how you know, the, the fiat and gold and, and sort of traditional sound money ideas, how it all connects. And traditionally, there's been two schools of thought. And when I did the episode with Brett, he certainly challenged me on that. He sort of, 
gave me some questions around, you know, what is money? You know, why, you know, what would commodity theory of money thinking, how, how, how would commodity theory of money thinking uh, kind of color your, your views on something like Bitcoin? But as a synergy, I think of commodity and ledger, um, it sort of got me a lot. It got me really thinking about sort of well, what underpins that um, that flow and that network. And so just to go on a little bit of a segue here, but mm-hmm. sort of the this idea when it comes to something like modern monetary theory, which is quite, uh, <laughs> excuse me. The, the source of all our problems, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, so <laughs> it, it's a, a, as a framework, I, I absolutely don't, you know, I disagree with it as a prescription, but as a framework, I think it actually does explain to an extent um, how money comes into being. You know, you have to, you know, you demand it for tax. And so somewhere, somehow you have to get your hands on fiat to pay your tax obligations, right? Yeah. And I think taking that framework and sort of, and I haven't fully done the work on this, but I, I feel like there's a, a way of transposing that onto uh, energy where in a way when you're Bitcoin mining, there's nothing else you can do with that energy. You've, you've spent it, right? There, there are some use cases in arbitrage with heat and waste heat usage, I think, sure. but for yep. the most part, that energy gets spent. And that yep. is a form of, um, it's a form of debt, right? You're, you've, you've, you've indebted the, that energy you've encumbered the network with that energy that's now gone. And so you then, that then sort of makes its way through the system and you have to spend some of that Bitcoin for transaction fees to, to then use your Bitcoin. And I, I haven't fully worked out how this works, but I, I think there is a, a relationship there that maybe mirrors some of our thinking around uh, credit theories of money where it, it is the miners and that use of energy that, that peg into proof of work and peg, that peg into the real world that just makes the whole thing go round. If that sort of makes sense, you know, it's not just magical ledger money that someone's like willed into existence. It requires you to actually lay on the table some actual kilowatt hours and spend them on something that cannot really be used for anything else to, to any degree, right? Yeah, and I think if we're we're talking about mainstream acceptance of bitcoin and and to get real cut through which i think is what a lot of people would like um myself i I consider myself one of those people that i think you know there's value in it having some mainstream appeal um it has to be translatable into a little bit something a bit more tangible that people can understand right because um if you just try and explain to them cold here's this new money the first question you get is well what's wrong with the credit card in my wallet right why 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 do i need a new form of money and then you you know you go down the rabbit hole of what is sound money and all that like you said but um if you can sort of point to something about well you know this is this is money that's backed by the clyde power station you know the we're producing we're producing money out of water um that's running through a dam you know um it it means something to people i think then you know they, they really feel that it's got a backing in something real in the world which i i really like well, coming back to your your sort of example, you know, how much heat does it take to, to warm up a cold room or, or something? I think going a bit further than that and understanding the, this kind of fundamental narrative of energy as the base resource of society and civilization. And yep. there's this classic essay, um, The Use of Knowledge in Society, which uh, is sort of the foundational Austrian economics text on how, you know, the, the price of a, of a pencil or, or some commodity and encompasses all of this knowledge and implicit um, kind of understanding of how much value is in that item um, from its uh, supply and demand side um, and, and all of the work that went into develop, you know, developing the, the thing, it can be summarized in that, that single number, which is the price, right? Uh, and there's other, there are a lot of other Austrian um, essays and uh, Austrian economics um, uh, people looking at that, 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 that place. But the problem is you obviously you fundamentally you, you, you mess with that when you start having um, inflationary money that can, um, you know, just be printed, right? But tying it back to energy and, you know, you use energy, factories use energy, transportation, mm-hmm. and energy, yep. it, it's all connected. Everything. And yep. then the fact that the pricing unit can also be in that same thing. So you've got Satoshi's measuring the energy, but then they are the price and it just compresses down into the singular unit that is the SAT. And that's like, you know, mind blowing, you know, we're no longer sort of operating with these two sort of different things that are trying to meet each other. It is just one unit for everything. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I, I could uh, make, I'm just thinking that out loud now and making a case for um, using sets and all my engineering calculations now is uh, 
as the unit instead of uh, you know kilowatt hours. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it it also globalizes it as well. So you've got you know power power can be generated somewhere. It can be turned into this digital energy, which is a classic trope now at this point. You know, digital energy, uh, yeah. but then it can be redeployed somewhere else. And uh, for example, in Japan, right? Um, you know, energy poor country. Um, I mean, there's a bit of nuke, nuclear here, but um, you know, they're importing oil. Uh, but a lot of manufacturing going on here, and you've got issues around that supply demand. You've got OPEC. You've got pricing of oil. It's all very messy. Um, and if you've got a unit for that that is maybe clearer, less noise in the pricing of energy. Um, I can see that actually enhancing your ability to manufacture and plan capital investments, perhaps. Um, I, I, don't know, I don't know how that works geopolitically, but you know, you've got these cartels who can set the price and it's, it's all connected back to the petrodollar, the US sort of hegemony. Yep. It's, it's kind of messy and I, I don't know how it all works, but it seems like Bitcoin's the simple solution to a lot of those issues. Yeah, and, and you know, in my experience, in the long run, the the simple solution is is what generally wins um, in the in the long run if it if it makes sense. Um, yeah. And you know, the the old kind of saying is uh, in politics, right? Is uh, if you're explaining, you're losing. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I think that sort of uh, applies um, as much as I'm loath to use politics as an example for for how we should operate in the world. <laughs> but um, you know, it's, uh, it's there's a lot of power in, in simple ideas i think and um at the heart of you know that energy bitcoin relationship i think is a simple idea which is which is quite powerful yeah well i mean along those lines i also i had a, i was having another conversation earlier today just around ai and high performance compute and yep. you know the sort of comment was how you know how much more energy is going to be required for hpc and and you know just running these ai training algorithms and stuff and i thought well you know look that's actually a really good thing you know, because it means we get to build more power stations um, and we get to build more AI. And uh, that yeah. narrative hasn't quite trickled down yet, I don't think. Of, of one, one interesting thing that I've observed with uh, the AI movement, because it's quite interesting to track it, it's been, you know, another big buzz thing that's, that's sort of taken over the world in the past couple of years. And um, I've observed, you know, not there's a few people that will point out, oh, gee, aren't we worried about, all the energy use, right? That's, you know, global warming, carbon emissions, all that kind of thing to do with AI. Um, nobody, not too many people say that about AI, but, you know, it's almost the first thing, the first criticism you get about Bitcoin, Bitcoin right? Is that, oh, what about all the, you know, coal pl coal plants in China that are mining the Bitcoin, you know, it's the people. And, you know, again, that understanding that the, the energy use in the Bitcoin network is a feature, not a bug. And I think that's... Um, that's a really important concept that not, not everybody took me a while to grasp that as well. I was, I was on the camp of, Oh, this, this energy use, how can, how can this thing's surely going to die because it's just so wasteful, right. To, to spend all this money, just hashing away. Um, but, you know, to understand that concept that actually that's so important for the security um, and the value in that network um, is, is a key concept that, that I love about the, you know, Bitcoin ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, it got me thinking, again, this is still a sketch that I'm sort of working on, but it got me thinking about, uh, you know, you've got fractional reserve banking, full reserve banking, these kind of ideas. And when it comes to energy use, you know, what in, in a hyper Bitcoinized world where, you know, power, electricity, uh, everything's priced in Satoshi's or it's, it's uh, underwritten by, you know, by Bitcoin at, at scale, what percentage of energy would be used on mining and i'm wondering you know if there's actually a calculation there where every unit that is uh, in the you know, in the economy is sort of underwritten by a kilowatt hour being used in the mining side and they sort of match each other and there's a kind of a an in you know full reserve energy kind of a concept mm. going on I, I don't quite know how that would work it's still just a <laughs> an idea that i think about in the shower now but it's sort of it would it match on one to one where economic growth and sort of the entire economy is pegged to this kind of you know there's a there's a clear connection between the growth of hash rate the growth of energy production and you know the world i guess oh i think i mean you you can draw a lot of parallels or lessons from history with that to to say that you know whenever we've managed to unlock more energy um, it's meant more prosperity um, for society, basically. So, um, I, I, you know, t 
to I, I see the only see the hash rate energy use going up, um, but you know you've got all these parallel uses of energy as well. Wherever we make more of it, we find more uses for it. You know the mm. AI is the classic example. Um, mm. So I, I don't think I can't see a world where the mining becomes more than a well even a double digit percentage of of world energy use. I'd, I'd find that very interesting if it, it ever got that far. Um, I think energy use will energy generation and energy production will will grow at least as fast as the the mining network grows yeah well i mean along those lines though, and i mean maybe maybe we, we need to workshop on this or something man but like i i was just working through these concepts of like my own personal sovereignty of how much hash that i have in my custody i've uh, been looking at okay well how much has the global hash rate increased since i got that that first machine um and then how do i need to match my own my current sort of um, ratio, I guess you could say, yeah, and, yeah, yep. and and these kinds of um, these kinds of questions, and I, I, they're just sort of pro, pro, uh, provocations at this point. But you know, what do I need to do to stay uh, competitive and keep my sort of percentage of of hash rate because that is continuing to grow, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. And, and what I've seen is it's actually growing at such a speed that. I, I could quite, I could see a world where it is, you know, every kilowatt that's used in, you know, the productive economy, sort of quote unquote, is actually matched by a kilowatt being used for mining, or or some ratio that some sort of connection. Some ratio, between, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that would be very interesting because then you've got this whole new kind of metric for measuring growth because you know GDP is often used, right? But that's a very messy loose way to measure because it, it you know it doesn't take into account the way the dollar has devaluate you know devalued over time um well the classic the classic example is that you know, you know um when this uh, vandal goes through a city smashing all the windows um it actually puts gdp up right because the the windows all have to be repaired lawyers get involved police police get involved and all of a sudden gdp has gone up but actually society's gone backwards because we've got a whole bunch of broken windows yeah um <laughs> yeah. Oh. so yeah i i love the idea of defining another way to define societal progress i think with you know and tying it to hash rate or something like that would or some some derivative of hash rate if it's not hash rate itself i think that would that could be really powerful yeah and i mean if, if if all things work you know well all things are connected right and so in your example there the window gets smashed uh, a piece of energy uh, you know some resource needs to be spent to go and fix that window uh, theoretically a hyper bitcoinized world would say that actually means some hash rate comes offline because some you know somewhere in the chain um, you know, there's maybe uh, sort of resources that are then being spent elsewhere. Um, and there's a, you know, you wouldn't be able to match it straight through, but there, there would yeah, be yeah. an aggregate effect. Um, similar to say, you know, if there's a war, you know, your productive economy, your, your factories go offline, right? Um, or they get diverted to producing things that are no longer uh, productive, you know, producing cruise weapons, missiles, yeah. cruise missiles and uh, sending them yeah. over to the Middle East. But um, I guess along those lines, just come back sort of quickly to the AI piece. Um, so I, I just was chatting to someone about this and there's certainly the political angle, you know, I feel like AI is a lot more kosher, you know, people can talk about AI in, in the halls of uh, parliament and not get the funny look, but when they talk about Bitcoin, as you know, <laughs> I, I yeah. think they're changing slowly. Um, but I was having another talk about AI with somebody and you know, they said to me, AI is going to put us back to work. And, and I guess what the intention of that comment was, is that, I mean, I'm, you're, I'm sure you've had a play with it, but some of the busy work and just the, the bullshit we have to do in our fiat lives, AI just can take it and do it, all right? You've got yep. to write an email, you've got to do a spreadsheet, whatever. And what I'm really interested in is the work you're doing um, with ElectroNet and, you know, this kind of physical real world work and how sort of innovation and the kind of future lies at the intersection of this digital and physical world because anything that's just purely digital it's it's going to get evaporated away it's going to be free zero cost ai is just going to do it but it's still someone has to do the work to put the power stations into the ground right so how do you see those two connecting yeah uh, this is a this is a big topic and one that i'm uh, quite uh, interested in and, and passionate about with uh, this kind of it's sort of it's related to that Will AI steal all my jobs? Right, uh, steal all our jobs, uh, kind of, kind of piece. And um, I, I think you're absolutely right that um, the potential for it to 
take away the drudgery in a lot of professional services roles. Um, amazing, you know, like I'm, a good chunk of my day um, is spent, you know, processing email, um, organizing meetings, um, that kind of thing. Just, you know, what is essentially admin type type work and AI can unlock. I've seen some pretty amazing demos. I think Copilot from, from Microsoft, not to name drop things, is, is pretty much already there with a lot of this stuff in terms of the ability to, to take that away from you. And that just, to me, that's just so exciting because it just unlocks, um, you know, the potential for your creative people to, to work on, like you say, real world problems, um, actually work on deploying these solar farms, deploying these wind farms, um, building out the infrastructure that we need to, to complement those, those massive projects, which is, uh, can be a bit of a forgotten piece, uh, especially with, you know, I think we talked about it a little bit uh, last time when we were with Mike uh, talking about that, the importance that the grid plays um, in, in linking all these uh, energy sources together. Um, and, you know, to, to sort of come full circle on that, um, uh, you know, if AI allows us to be more effective and more productive in our, in our work, it just, it just accelerates that, that transition. Um, we can get these projects online quicker we can complement them with Bitcoin mines um, to, to help pay for them because essentially that's at the moment where I see a little bit of a barrier um, in the industry is, and I think you had Blair Walter on to talk a little about this a while ago, you know, you've got to get, to get these projects across the line, these big, you know, these are mega scale infrastructure projects for New Zealand, um, you know, talking hundreds of millions in some cases over a billion dollars worth of infrastructure in order to build these projects. And a billion is not what it used to be, but um, <laughs> thanks to inflation. But um, you know, you, you need you need someone to to essentially underwrite that um, project, right? And the um, the way the underwrite an energy project is, you need someone to buy the energy, basically. Um, and if you don't have that buyer, um, then uh, your project's dead in the water, basically. And in New Zealand, we're a small economy um, with not a lot of um, large industrial capacity. You know, we've got TY as one big example, and you know, a handful of other um, large energy users, but not a huge manufacturing economy. And in order to get these projects viable, you know, having something like a, a Bitcoin mine to, if not underwrite the whole project, because that's probably unrealistic, but to underwrite a portion of that project, um, it just could be the difference between, you know, getting some of these projects across the line. Or, or having them languish and, and not be developed. So, um, yeah, it's a, yeah. A sort of changed topic a little bit, but that's um, that you know AI is an enabler um, for for some of these things. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, I guess I am aware that there is a narrative, you know, there's kind of the AI hype wagon, you know, and I'm I'm certainly in the critical camp that sort of looks at and says, oh, you know, there's kind of LinkedIn soy boys talking about how AI is going to do this and that. But actually, actually, what I think we're seeing happen just in the free market, um, uh, or in the market, it's maybe not free, but, uh, you know, we've got massive restructuring of government and government, if you want to talk about drudgery, um, the public service, the public sector, you know, it, it is a drudgery all day, every day. And those jobs are going, those people are out of work, um, because yep. it's not sustainable. Um, and I think, AI, uh, just even a percentage, I, and I, I know there is a percentage value that that already has for just day-to-day -day jobs. You know, I've used it to help me with coding, helping mm -hmm. doing documents. Yeah, I mean, you've used it. Uh, it's not 100% or anything, but there's certainly a number where that is certainly making a difference. And so yep. I see that increasing over time, and I'm much more excited now, even personally, around when coming back to the physical world, you know, looking at the mining side, looking at what I can do in my local community, what I can do around me, this kind of idea that we're all going to be sort of just digital hyper uh, connected uh, online. I, I think that basically trends to zero. You know, there's there's no, uh, it's kind of like the news, you know, no one pays for news anymore. Um, you have mm -hmm. to be doing something else. And I think where that comes in is, is the real world, you know, shovel, you know, shovel ready work um, in the ground. And I, I think New Zealand needs it, man. Yeah, I think, I think we, some somewhere along the lines of the last, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years, we, we sort of lost our, our way in, in what we value um, as a society a little bit. And I think it is not, this is not unique to New Zealand though, by the way, I mean, it, 
they've got similar problems in in the US um, as well, just to, and the UK. I know you know infrastructure is a problem because it's not sexy. It's not sexy to to build infrastructure. It was sexy to build a new motorway, um, but it's not sexy to maintain your existing motorways or your existing transmission lines, or because you, your politician can't point to these things and say, "Look what I've done." You know, look what look what I've enabled. I've enabled this uh, pothole to be repaired. And um, that, that doesn't seem to have a lot of cut through, but yeah, that somehow we've got to find a mechanism to to place more value on looking after what we have um, and, and looking after it well. Um, but also, like you say, to have a bit of vision on on how we can improve, also improve what we've got for the next generation as well and, and leave it in a better space. Yeah. Well, I think there is a vision. Um, uh, I was talking to Matthew Birchall about, about it. He's sort of... Um, you know, fostering a culture of building again. You know, New Zealand has always had this DIY kind of get it done attitude, but I think that has been subverted just with big government and this kind of, uh, uh, you know, paradigm shift in, in the role of the nanny state, which kind of was always there. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think I, I look around me, you know, when I'm in Asia and I look at just the the depth of infrastructure, you know, there's bullet trains and there's high voltage power lines everywhere. There's concrete and, and it's not necessarily beautiful in the sense of na natural beauty, but man, New, New Zealand at, at a base layer, there's not much there. You know, the floods really showed that, showed that to me firsthand. It's like, man, Japan, you know, even China, different places I've traveled to, it's like, there's so much infrastructure, so much uh, layers of infrastructure. And then what that enables the network effect of, being able to have factories that are connected to this and then connected to that, you can go from one end of the country to the other on a 300 kilometer an hour train, you know, and yep, it's a multiplier. Infrastructure is a multiplier, right? It just, it just, uh, it, it levels up everything in your economy. And, you know, historically in the, you know, fifties and sixties and earlier governments saw that as their function was to, to build, to help enable uh, these types of uh, infrastructure projects that, they could see we're going to level up the economy. Um, yeah. And for some reason, uh, you know, we've sort of, like you say, sort of lost our way a little bit um, and and not quite understanding that one-to-one -one look. You know, maybe it's, there's, there's so many factors here. It's kind of hard to untangle. You know, it's the, you know, the the Twitter soundbite culture plays a role too in it, right? And um, you know, the lack of deep thinking um, at times. And yeah, it's a, it's, it's a real bird's nest of um, causes and effects and, and things. Well, yeah, and again, so I, I don't um, definitely don't want to come off like I'm, I'm shitting on New Zealand too much because I think we, we've been given, the, you know, that we've inherited this situation, and it's up to people like us to actually, you know, f fix it, totally. right? Yeah. Um, and and so that's why you know I am going you know going all in on this idea that I think Bitcoin um, and Bitcoin mining in particular, those two pieces at a policy kind of leadership level actually uh, are, are critical right and, and it, it needs to kind of connect with a grassroots movement as well but another thing you i guess what, what this connects to with what uh, what you you messaged to me earlier around energy self-sovereignty so um what, what does this mean for new zealand because it feels like energy sovereignty and infrastructure are sort of very much connected right yeah it's a great great segue the what i i mean i i'm quite passionate about um, climate change, I think we touched on that and, you know, getting us to a place where we're, we're not just pumping out carbon to, to meet our energy needs. And I, we've got a heck of a long way to go, um, in the world to, to get to that space. And, um, what, you know, yeah, and, you know, to look at, to take New Zealand as a case study, right. You know, we, we are importing, I, I don't know how many, I'm not going to quote a number because it, I'll, I'll be wrong. <laughs> I haven't done my research prior, but um, yeah. thousands, millions of barrels of hundreds of millions of barrels of oil um, every year, right. To, to power our vehicles and our economy and move our goods and services around the, the country. And that, that all comes from overseas. You know, we, we used to have a little bit of, we still do, I think have a little bit of um, self um, petroleum production, but it's, it's pretty minor compared to how much we consume. So we are, you know, reliant on huge tankers coming in from overseas with all this refined product. And, it, you know, we, we just you just talked about this veneer of civilization that we have um, in New Zealand with our infrastructure. But, you know, you think about our ports and, you know, we rely on these ships bringing the fuel to come in to keep this economy running at the moment. And if, you know, if, if a 
you know, a bad earthquake happened and took out a few of our ports, we'd be in a real bad space with trying to get fuel um, to, to run our economy. And we just, it would just, the country would just grind to a halt overnight. So what I like about um, self-sovereignty and getting more electricity um, is that we, we make all our own electricity. We make it locally. Um, you know, we have to imp- import the, the solar panels and the wind turbines and things, but once you have that infrastructure, it's there for 20, 30, 40 years, um, and it's and it keeps generating electrons um, the whole time. But during that time, it's not reliant on that next tanker coming in from overseas that is vulnerable to terrorism, is vulnerable to um, you know weather events, all those kind of things. So, to me, self sovereignty is about just increasing, you know, doubling down, going hard on electrifying our economy, making getting you know massive infrastructure building these big energy projects so that we can be more reliant on electricity to minimize our, our basically our fuel consumption, because I see that as our, our huge Achilles heel at the moment is all this fuel that we're, that we're importing and we don't yeah. have local supplies. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, along those lines, I mean, I think there's a certain geopolitical awareness or sort of um, way of thinking that is challenging in New Zealand because it is so remote and I was you know I was back there for a couple of years and I just when you're on the island you're you're on the island and the rest of the world's very far away and someone is organizing things and they come on the boat Um, however I think looking at it from the perspective of Japan which is a similar sort of geography it's island you know geoactive earthquakes all the time Um, also not really super uh, in terms of hydrocarbons it's not self-sovereign it needs to import um, the way they've solved this uh, is with nuclear. Nuclear, um, yeah. yeah. And it's quite profound, like, as I said before, just the the, the depth of, uh, you know, the layers of paint of infrastructure here, the, the depth of infrastructure anywhere I look around. I mean, no, no matter how far you are in the countryside, there's concrete pylons, there's reinforced banks of, you know, of, you know, cut through mountains, they've cut through, um, you know, rivers, they've built highways over the top of things just to make sure that the entire country is connected and functioning as an economy, whereas all it takes is a little bit of rain and the east, the, the east coast of New Zealand is cut off, which yep. is actually yep. quite freaky, man. And we managed to get through, but how much, you know, we, we basically cut down to the bone when that happened. Yeah, um, for, you know, the, and it's, it, we're going to get more of these events, right? All the science is telling us that. Um, and there's no, um, it's the, the next one, might not be as bad we might get lucky again but we, we we've got the revolver with one one loaded chamber right and yeah. it, we keep spinning it and hoping that it keeps coming up blank right and it and at the moment uh you know we, we don't know when that when that full chamber is going to line up and take out um you know the country in some more severe way and you know I, i'll be the first person to to hope that it never does and you know that's what this conversation is partly about right is it's sort of a a motivation to to get on and do the work and and make us more resilient, which I yeah. think is something that we can we can hope for and hope. Bitcoin to me is an enabler of that resilience yeah. piece. Well, I, I guess along those lines, um, I'm keen to dive into into the energy piece a little bit, and then um, we've got I've got some other topics here. But when it comes to solar, now this is something there is um, I guess some discussion about this, long, you know, sort of in the in the Bitcoin space more broadly around what the the value proposition is of renewables you know this mm-hmm. uh, i think a certain narrative that maybe solar isn't actually what it's all hyped up to be but you write about this a lot you talk about this a lot so i mean how do you see solar maybe wind as well fitting into the picture and sort of yeah how, how does it all work together yeah great great question i'm a what I call myself, I'm a I'm a super solar bull, I suppose. Is <laughs> solar maximalist. <laughs> I've been on the I've been on the solar train a long. I've been on the the Bitcoin train actually. Um, I, I put panels on my house in, in Melbourne back in 2012, I think it was. And Australia was at like like quite a few things. They're sort of about 10 years ahead of us in, in some of these things. Um, but uh, you know what we've seen. Um, if I start with the solar, I'll, I'll talk touch on wind in a minute. But um, in the solar space. What we've seen over the past, well, it's really been a story of the the past 40 years uh, or even longer ago if you follow the research back, but we've seen this dramatic uh, reduction in cost um, for, for the panels basically themselves. And if you're trying to to build a, a large infrastructure project or even a, a small infrastructure project like solar, 
um, the, the panels still make up the majority of the, the cost of the project. It's in the vicinity of, you know, 30 to 40 percent of that that project cost. But what we keep seeing is um, decade over decade or year over year, even um, this price keeps falling. Um, even in, you know, our inflationary times and our mega inflationary times, it we had a little bit of a, a stop of the reductions during, say, 22, 21, 22. But um, in the last year uh, or two, it's it's resumed its downward trajectory. Um, there's a there's a concept called rights law, which applies to a lot of these kind of technologies in the space where basically every time you double the production of a certain item, it, it falls in price by a certain percentage. And solar, depending on what you read and what research you look, has got a, a, a price reduction rate of sort of 30%. Um, for every doubling of production, and and that's that's pretty amazing. So you know, it's today, it's um, you know, it's it's must be about one tenth of the cost of it was you know ten or fifteen years ago in terms of the panel cost. Um, so to me, I just see this the way I see this playing out is that it just gets more and more dominant um, in the energy space as a way of producing energy because you know we talked about it earlier in the conversation going to zero the effectively what how it plays out in the energy space is the cost of energy you know goes towards zero because of because of the low cost of solar um and it will never go quite to zero because you're always going to have a you know some fundamental cost for the underlying infrastructure for you know the the labor the the expertise that goes into to building it but um it's it's going to bottom out it's still a long way from bottoming out it's going to bottom out at a very low value um and you know we touched on this as well earlier in the conversation. When whenever we find more abundant sources of energy in the world, we find ways of using them. And so it just unlocks. When energy becomes cheaper, it just unlocks more uses of that energy. So what I what I see playing out because of the influence of solar uh, over the next decade is a real downward pressure on electricity prices, which. Um, it might might come as a bit of a shock to some people who keep paying bigger and bigger power bills, but um, it, I, I think we're we're on the cusp of of seeing some profound change um, in the in the electricity space in terms of cost. And yes, there are some issues that that need to be worked through. You know, the the obvious one that that people always talk about with solar is that you know you, you don't get much solar generation when it's uh, night time, and and it's very it's very true, but. Uh, in complement to that um, solar generation is it an incredible price performance reduction also in batteries. Um, so you, you're going to have this, this, this beautiful kind of interlinked uh, virtuous cycle where solar gets cheaper, batteries are getting cheaper. People are like, okay, well, let's, you know, and we're already seeing it in the energy space. Most solar projects now, not so much in New Zealand, but, but in Australia, US, they get paired with a battery. And so you then you have the ability because it's so cheap to generate this energy in the middle of the day. You say, well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna release it to the grid uh, in the middle of the day. I'm gonna save that in my battery, and then I'm gonna pump it back into the grid at six o'clock when mum and dad get home, uh, fire up the the heat pump um, with the heater, and that energy's in a bit higher demand. So batteries and solar are like the the match made in heaven. Yeah, I see. You know, we, we're already seeing this in New Zealand in terms of the the way that solar is dominating the future project space. And Transpower's got a pretty public um, queue of projects that they've got stacked up, um, looking to connect to the grid. And I, I did some numbers about a month ago, and seventy percent of those projects are, are currently by capacity of solar uh, at the moment. So we're still going to have a role for in New Zealand for for wind. It's still going to be an important um, resource. Um, but it's going to struggle to compete, I think, in the long run with the, the continual cost of solar, uh, because wind is fundamentally uh, a, there's a bit more involved from an infrastructure point of view. Um, you know, there's, these are big, these are big, big machines that you know need serious amounts of concrete in the ground um, in order to to grow them. The beauty of solar is it's so scalable. It's like Bitcoin in a lot of ways. Um, you know, you can put one panel on your roof. Or you can put a million panels on a farm and have a massive project. Um, so, you know, the, the scalability and the ease of deployment um, uh, are, again, some more of its superpowers. So um, yeah. I'm going to have to get somebody to take me down from my my solar high, I think. But um, <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> my, 
that's my yeah. little rant about you know how how you know optimistic I am um, about the solar space. I, I think uh, it maybe comes back to narrative a little bit. I, I think just maybe within the Bitcoin space, there has been some criticisms of uh, maybe wind more than solar, and mm -hmm. I think there are some valid arguments there. Uh, however. It is also maybe being postured that those arguments are being put out there because the alternative is shutting down perfectly fine nuclear power plants in places like Germany um, and, and even Japan. I think they've been talking about you know retiring some of these plants and a few other things which are driven by misaligned incentives. But um, yeah, I, I think having this. Yeah, having an open and honest conversation about this stuff. I mean, for example, I've moved into a new apartment here and we've got solar on the roof and uh, this is the first time I've ever experienced it. And I was actually, my jaw dropped and this is a bit naive, but I realized this is all of these new apartments in Japan that have these solar panels on top and we they're selling into the grid and we actually get a rebate yeah. as just, you know, and, and, um, and this is just a rental. Um, but we, we, you know, we're basically paying, you know, any, we, we don't use much power here. And so we're getting paid by these things yeah, that are yeah, on the roof yeah. and you, and you can have them live. anywhere, <laughs> you can have them anywhere, you know, like, um, yeah, yeah. again, yep. if you just any flat surface, you know, um, yeah. That, and that's the, that's the revelation for solar is that, you know, you know, I saw an article actually the other day and in, in, in Germany, the, the it's, it was a bit of, it was a little bit clickbaity, but the, the article was, you know, solar panels are now so cheap that the farmers are using them for fence fencing, you know, um, <laughs> and it's, and it, and it's, you know, there's, there comes a point where these panels are just so cheap that you just put them everywhere. And it doesn't matter if they're not quite at the optimal angle or they're not quite pointing to the North or the South in the, in the Northern hemisphere, um, because they're just so cheap that you, you get a little bit of energy from them and, and they all stack up and you wire them all together and, and away you go. Yeah. Yeah. No, look, I, I think there's something to explore there in the future, um, just around the economics of that and sort of stepping out of the mindset. I think there is a defensive mindset that um, I think is, is a valid stance, which is that these renewables and this push for these renewables by you know, often by governments and it sort of feels like it's a, a bit of a thing. And, and Bitcoin's like, hey, just leave me alone. I, I want my diesel, you know, and my coal. Yep. But actually, yep. you know, unpicking the truth that there is maybe a, a synergistic relationship there um, and how it could work for somewhere like New Zealand, which has got huge amounts of, you know, open, you know, sparsely populated land. Um, you can run sheep under these things, you know, you, you, you don't need them to be offsetting um, productive industry, right? No, no, absolutely. And, and the cool thing, just to touch on that, um, yeah, because the valid criticism of of solar and, and wind in, in other countries has been heavily subsidized by, by the government and, I think that's, you know, you can make the argument that, you know, we should be subsidizing these industries to try and bootstrap them up. Um, that I don't, I don't want to get too far into that that rabbit hole, but um, one thing that we can, if you take the other viewpoint in New Zealand, we can be quite proud of is that we haven't subsidized solar in New Zealand um, right? at all. There's, I don't think there's ever been a dollar that's been given to by, by the government, by the public sector towards solar deployment in, in New Zealand. Um, and so it's the industry here, and it's just, you know, it's still in its infancy, but um, it has bootstrapped itself up from from the ground with with no assistance from government, and and away it's going. It's just taking off, you know. And it, again, it just comes down to that. At some point, there comes a time where mum and pop say, "Oh yeah, it makes sense to put them on my roof." Um, and you know, we're seeing that you know play out around the country at the moment. Well, hey, my my dad's just put someone on his roof, so <laughs> yeah. Um, but hey, uh, thanks, <laughs> yeah. thanks for sharing that, man. I didn't know that because uh, I mean that is a criticism that you know the government, you know, the taxpayers are paying for these things. Um, and maybe in the case of wind, would you is that is that true, or do you know? I mean, there's definitely been some involvement in the wind industry um, by the government. Um, it probably more. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't want to sort of step out of line with with the facts here, but probably not so much in directly funding projects, but more. Um, on the research side, and you know, I know the Brooklyn wind turbine, I think was partially um, potentially government funded or, or even ECNZ back in the day. So, um, yeah, but but even wind, I don't think it's, I don't think you'd point to the story of wind in New Zealand and say that uh, the um, where, where it is now is a function of investment that the government's made in, in the technology. Um, I, don't, I don't think you can say the same thing um, for overseas places you know, I know Germany 
um, has poured a lot of money into wind and solar um, for their for their own reasons. But um, yeah, in New Zealand, we've we've tended to stay away from the the subsidy approach in the energy space, which um, yeah. in, in recent times anyway, and certainly in my career, um, and that's I think that's been been a positive. Yeah. Um, so I guess coming back to something you talked about though, um, with the you know there's a lot of projects that are underway. There's a lot of things happening. Uh, would you say though, uh, New Zealand's ability to actually build build stuff out in terms of pure just manpower, you know, resources, equipment, these kinds of things, are we heading towards a, a project crunch? Yeah, it's, a, it's going to be a really interesting few years as some of these projects, what we say, shake out um, because it's one thing to come in from overseas and we've seen a little bit of this overseas developer and come and find a, a nice paddock in the countryside and say, I'm going to build a solar farm here. Um, but then any number of obstacles will, will get in the way of, of bringing that project to reality, right? So, you know, the, the first one might be as simple as getting consent um, from the from the regional council or the local council, or um, the, the next one might be, oh, you found a great paddock, but you're, you're kilometers and kilometers away from the nearest transmission infrastructure or grid infrastructure. So, you know, that's going to sink the project because you just, you can't afford to buy do the new line to get it in. Um, and then the other one that, sometimes there's a bit of an afterthought that people think about is the, you know, who's going to buy the energy. Um, the A lot of people are thinking, oh, I'll just sell it on the open market. We have an open market in New Zealand for energy. But um, one thing we know about markets is when they get flooded by every solar farm in the country, for example, generating energy at the same time, which they will, they're all coincident. It's just going to kill the price um, at that time of day. So unless you've got a buyer, like a some kind of power purchase agreement for that energy, then that that could also sink the project. So um, there's those three things, and then the one you touched on is you know do we have the the labour force and the people to actually build these projects? And that's still an open question for me. I, I think New Zealanders are, have proven themselves over the years to be pretty good at um, you know getting on with stuff and, and responding to a need. And I think to a certain extent the market will take care of that. You know the, the these are the, the, another really positive thing about solar is that it's not difficult to construct. It's like a giant Meccano set, basically. You, you, you're doing up bolts. Um, and I'm, I'm simplifying it a little bit, but, you know, there's not very elaborate foundations and, and these types of things to, to build it. So um, it actually creates a lot of meaningful work um, for people and, and sort of semi-skilled work that um, people can do that, um, you know, has real value um, to the economy. And um, I, I, I see that, um, it's it's a real enabler for you know some of those lower wage jobs potentially um, to to come in and provide resource to to help build these projects. So I think in summary, yep, uh, we're going to get a little bit of uh, a shaking out of projects. Um, some of them will fall over for various reasons, and the best projects will emerge um, from from that. And I think the the labour problem will, to a certain extent, take care of itself with the market and you know. Um, wages and, and that type of thing so yeah yeah well I, I think um no thank you brad and i think at a high level maybe it could be cool to close on i guess some of the the visionary leadership side of things because um i actually had a friend working in uh, um, the industry organization around civil uh, civil infrastructure and um i know f sort of from working with him and talking to him that there's a huge uh, lack of uh, late, you know, there's a real labour shortage um, for civil engineering and civil infrastructure, whether it's just you know manual labour or, or more skilled engineering, yep. project management stuff. Um, and you know, you've got I don't know how many, you know, a handful of companies. One of them that looks like it's on the ropes, uh, who actually build scale, you know, infrastructure at scale. Um, and again, I compare that with my experience here uh, in, in Asia. And you've got just world leading mega corporations, you know, who can just put 20 people on it. Uh, where in New Zealand it would be one person, you know? Um, yep. And so what does that look like? I mean, maybe does this come back to sort of our engagement with policymakers and looking at immigration, looking at um, kind of some of these policy settings that are relevant to these things? And, and I guess in your work, what are the vehicles that you've seen for industry and government to kind of communicate about these issues? I mean, engineers love a good conference, right? We, uh, we... <laughs> I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit conferenced out, to be honest. I've been to quite a few in in the last sort of few years, and 
um, it, uh, talking's great and sharing ideas and collaborating and stuff. I, I, you know, I love that. It's good stuff and it's what we're doing today, right? But um, you know, the, at some point you you get a bit fed up with with just talking and you want, you want to you do the work, you know, the, yeah. the proof of work and, and get in there and, and get stuck in. And I think you know, I, as a people, I think New Zealanders are that's something that we can leverage. You know, people the people are hardworking generally. Um, they're motivated, um, smart people who are connected to the I think the country and the and the the, the earth, um, and we, um, we we like to get on and, and work hard and, and do a good job. And I think you know if we provide an opportunity um, for for people to to do meaningful work, they'll come, they'll respond. I mean, people are looking everywhere you look in the world at the moment. People are looking for meaning, right, in in their life and their personal lives and their work lives and, and everything. And you know. And you see it when when people create meaningful projects and meaningful work. You know, it's like a it's like a magnet drawing drawing everyone in, right? And it's and I think we we, we have great potential um, in New Zealand to you know to to create really meaningful work and really meaningful projects. And I think the energy space is um, you know one way that I'm I'm optimistic and hopeful that we can we can leverage to help make that happen. Yeah, no, th- thank you, man. And I, what you said around that search for meaning, it's sort of um... I think of, uh, was it Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning, you know, and I mean, we are going through some really trying times. Um, I think it's a psychological battle of anything. Um, we're sort of, what do we do now? And and it's all connected because you're talking about, we're talking about AI and the sort mm-hmm. of, you know, as far as I can see, any kind of just process work that is would have traditionally been, been considered a job is going away. You know, those people will retire out and, and move on or, or be made yep. redundant but i think now as as, as as i said earlier i think we get to do the real work um you know this kind of computer sophistry you know kind of data entry stuff can go away uh, and i know firsthand for me you know i'm i'm actively looking at what i can be involved in um you know and and, and what i can build um i couldn't think of anything more exciting than working on like a major uh, energy project in any capacity you, you know and um, I mean, how do you get that out there? You know, like um... I mean, there's there's lots of ways. There's lots of different roles for different types of businesses in the space. You know, obviously, I'm in the consulting space. Um, you know, we we do design work and um, you know feasibility type type stuff as well. Um, but you know, there's going to be roles and for the contractors who do who do the building, um, subcontractors who you know just are employing bodies basically to help to help build these things. And um, and then you know you come to the um, the media people, um, and, and, you know, they've got a role in, uh, <laughs> I was just about going to call you a, a media person. Cody, are you a media person? A media I don't personality? Know, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't want to be associated with the mainstream media in, in any capacity, <laughs> but I, I, I think the high level though, Brad, is I, I see the connectivity between people because as I, say, I, I have a lot of conversations with people and I, I, I can connect the dots and say, oh, okay. You know, I, I bumped into a guy here in Kamakura who's um, working for a, a very large oil company, uh, oil and gas company, and um, we, we've been chatting about um, Bitcoin mining. And um, he's he's very uh, very interested and very knowledgeable about oil and gas and yep. hadn't didn't know anything about Bitcoin, so I gave him a bit of an overview. And, um, you know, that's that's a connection that I was able to, um, I was able to uh, develop and I see connections with what you're doing with all the people that I've spoken with and it's sort of like yeah it's, it's sort of this movement this kind of um builders revolution or something where you know we're sort of putting down the computers and the bullshit and saying all right it's time to actually make some stuff again um the world i don't know it's like there's like a calling it's sort of like a zeitgeist almost um mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and you see it you know i i was reading through riot um you know the texas bitcoin miners and just reading the um, investor report and man, just the scale of their facilities and what they're doing, man, that is so fucking cool. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, that for me, that's the new um, tech sector. You know, everyone five, ten years ago, everyone wanted to work in tech. Everyone wanted to become a programmer and a developer in San Francisco. Yep. Now, now I'm like, man, uh, everyone is everyone going to want to start building infrastructure because that's way more fulfilling, way more interesting. Oh. You know, I mean that, that's a world that I, I'd love to be part of. We're, we're, we're... <laughs> a renaissance of uh, yeah. yeah, of building a renaissance stuff. of infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bitcoin renaissance. Um, well, look, man, that's um, that's really exciting. I'm, 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 I'm really, um, it's really interesting to learn, um, learn about what you're working on. And I hope in the future, we, you mentioned at the beginning this um, new Bitcoin mine that's 
coming online soon. Um, I hope yeah, we can yeah. talk more about that in the future. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully, I'd love to. Um, I've yeah. been trying to connect with uh, the gentleman who's um, who's setting it up, and I he hasn't uh, been able to get him just yet. So I'm, I'm quite keen to have a good good conversation with him and uh, and find out you know a bit more detail about the project. But uh, when I do, and, and when he's uh, when he's comfortable um, sharing some details, I'll I'll be sure to to shout it from the rooftops. Yeah. Cool. All right, Brad. Thank you so much for your time um, on a uh, on a Tuesday evening. Um, uh, I know it's um, uh, it's a bit late there, but we'll um, we'll hopefully keep in touch. And um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, very definitely. Much. You know, thanks thanks for the opportunity to, to come back and uh, and talk again. I uh, really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, I always feel like there's there's so much more to talk about when when we catch up. But uh, yeah, yes. we'll have to leave it for uh, for another time. Awesome. No thank you. Thank you for listening. I do hope you enjoyed the show. I am Cody Allingham and that was the transformation of value. If you would like to get in touch, please send me an email at hello at the transformation of value.com and I will get back to you.